Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Ian Bushfield. I'm the Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association and just before we begin I'll say a few words before turning it over to tonight's speaker. Uh, it's been really great to see so much interest in this topic. I see already over 20 people on the call. We had over 47, almost 50 RSVPs I believe. Um, hopefully this sparks further discussions on tackling racism in policing, the criminal justice system and society at large. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge I'm, that I live and work on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Honkamanum and Skohomish speaking peoples, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be on this shared territory. Uh, Corey's joining us tonight from Bellingham, and I don't know the traditional territories there. I believe it's the Dodohamish people. Uh, that's for Seattle, but um, you know, all of these lands were at one point someone else's. A couple quick housekeeping notes as well. Given the turnout tonight, everyone who's uh, joined has been muted automatically. This is not because we don't want to hear what you have to say, it's just the accidental mic bumping and stuff that might inadvertently interrupt the presentation and kind of make it less enjoyable for everyone else. Do feel free to use the chat function to post your questions, either just privately to me or to the whole group at everyone. Uh, I'll try to bring those up to, with Corey at the end. Do be respectful of everyone else in there though don't just keep smashing comments and really make it unusable. The talk is also being live streamed on our Facebook page. Uh, I'll be watching for questions and comments there and we're recording this talk to release it later on our YouTube channel. Okay, tonight's talk is entitled A Humanist Perspective on Black Males in the Criminal Justice System. Humanism is a worldview that at its core is about promoting human dignity and equality. The recent wave of protests against systemic racism in the USA, in Canada, and around the world are highlighting just how far we have to go as a society to realize those values. Just like our partners at Humanist International, the American Humanist Association, and Humanist UK, I can say the BC Humanist Association believes Black Lives Matter. Uh, on the topic of tonight's talk on criminal justice reform, one of our past honorary members who died a number of years ago, Claire Colhane, spent her later years and much of her life fighting for prison reform and abolition in Canada in response to the often inhumane conditions she witnessed firsthand. The BCHA is a charitable organization, of course, uh, and is able to only do the work and put on talks like this due to the generosity of our members and supporters. If you aren't a member yet, consider becoming one for as little as $10 at bchumanist.ca slash join. And also given the topic tonight, consider supporting the black community either here in BC or in America through organizations such as Black Lives Matter Vancouver, the Hogan's Alley Society, or the Black in BC Community Support Fund for COVID-19, who are giving small grants to uh, Black people in Vancouver. All right, our speaker tonight is Corey Clay. He has 14 years of experience in various academic settings, including as an adjunct professor at private universities in Portland, Oregon, and Houston, Texas. His academic interests have included police violence, probation, and the criminalization of cannabis, as well as the dehumanization of the blackmail form by police and other entities. And we were talking just before the uh, discussion began about how some of his past experiences as a probation officer as well. So he's been kind of on the front lines of the criminal justice system, as well as studying it for a number of years. As well, on his spare time, he's spent a lot of time working on equity and diversity issues. He's been involved with black non-believers in the states and he's in the slow process of moving to Vancouver a situation somewhat more difficult by COVID-19 and the closure of the border but I will let Corey speak to all of that right now I'll turn it over to you thanks so much Ian and uh it's good to good to speak to you today um and and to be let's speak to other humanists um so yeah um I'll, I'll first give my my bio um I grew up in Texas I'm a, a southerner I grew up in a uh, a small town called Richmond, Texas, about 30 miles outside of Houston. Um, grew up there, myself and my little sister. Uh, pretty uh, average upbringing, you know, pretty, you know, pretty middle class, you know, middle class black people from the South. Uh, my mother worked in insurance. Uh, my little sister is a PhD. She teaches uh, in Texas. Uh, but I grew up um, and didn't really have much contact uh, with law enforcement. Of course, when growing up, um, went to college in Missouri for a year. Uh, after college, I, um, you know, after a year of college, um, I just realized, okay, this wasn't for me at the time. Uh, I did okay. Uh, came back home, 
and sort of, you know, just hung around and then joined the military. Uh, I was stationed in Hawaii for three years. I was infantry, um, pretty much a grunt. Um, I was a grunt for three years. And, and the main reason I joined the military was to sort of explore, uh, but also we will talk about the GI Bill. The GI Bill pretty much paid for my education. And then I started teaching criminal justice um, as well. And using those experiences that I had from, um, you know, working in the criminal justice system and advising and sort of educating students. Uh, I've also mentored, and when it comes to mentoring, I mentored every type of person. Like, I don't care about race, but I have primarily mentored black males. And, uh, and we'll, we'll sort of get into that. You know, we're, we're humanists, and not everybody's humanist, but I consider myself a humanist. But I, I look at humanism uh, through the lens of dehumanization. And when you work in law enforcement for as long as I did, you start to see how dehumanization affects um, different groups of people differently. Uh, after teaching, uh, I got half a PhD at a, a place called Texas Southern University uh, and then left there and decided, um, my wife and I, you know, we decided we're going to move to Canada. So um, I'll probably go back and get my doctorate later, but uh, I think there's other work that you know, I, I can do at this point. Um, as far as, that's my bio, as far as the criminal justice system and, you know, what I teach in criminology, what I've taught in criminology and the states, as Ian was saying, there are some similarities between Canada and the U.S. Um, for me, when I start to discuss the criminal justice system, I start from the, the, the basics to what's, where it started from and what's going on now. Um, the criminal justice system in America started from the slave patrols. And when you have something that starts from that, uh, it, it, it's a bad start. And that's the way I, I can, I, my, my concept is like, when I think about America, America itself, uh, the concept was supposed to be a melting pot, but not for everybody. But you had uh, the slave patrols, the first uh, black people, African Americans entered America in 1619. Uh, so from 1619 until 1863, uh, you had slavery in America. That was uh, 244 years. So let's say, uh, yeah, right, right around that time. Yeah. And then from there, you had Reconstruction, which lasted 14 years. And after the Civil War, what Reconstruction was supposed to do was integrate Black people into society. Uh, after Reconstruction, you had this, this time frame. Um, you know, during the Black Codes from the end of the 1900s, I mean, end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, you had the Black Codes and you had Jim Crow and you had segregation. Uh, what Jim Crow did was basically solidify the fact that Black people in America were going to be second class citizens uh, until something changed. And that change happened with the Civil Rights Movement. Um, so the reason I give you that time frame is because from civil rights until now, his, it's only been, you know, when civil rights uh, ended, the civil rights movement ended, people say that it's actually still going on. Um, we've only, black people in America have only had civil rights for 66 years. We were enslaved longer than we've had civil rights. And so when I hear this terminology, well, pull yourself up from the bootstraps. I'm the very definition of that. But once again, I, my mother worked hard, my grandparents worked hard, uh, my grandfather was a uh, Korean vet, my great grandfather, World War II. When my grandfather came back from the Korean War, he couldn't even use the GI Bill that I could use because he was black. So we were, you know, black people and that whole, you know, pull yourself up, you know, and, and what I find funny is when they try to equate blacks uh, with laziness. My grandfather worked from the age of eight to the age of 72. He's still alive. He worked, you know, he, we had to make him retire at 72 years old. He's 82 now, um, but he basically um, was born in 1938, and I can still physically see him and touch him. He was born in 1938, and he would tell me stories about lynchings. That's not too, re too far removed from me. My grandfather actually saw lynchings happen when he was six years old in 1944. So what I'm saying is that this stuff is interconnected through slavery, to civil rights, to, you know, to now. So what, what, what I keep seeing on the streets now of uh, the United States of America especially is that what happened with slavery was never reconciled. 
And until it is reconciled, this stuff is going to keep uh, perpetuating. The black male form in particular, and I uh, by no means want to be dismissive of black females, but my, my main study has, has been on what I am, the black male form. Um, whether it's fear or rejection or whatever the case may be, my thesis in life was that the black male form after slavery was never meant to be in America, much less thrive. Um, statistically, if you look at everything that's happened, that bears out. Now that's not to say that you can't, as a black male, be successful. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that we have had to deal with certain setbacks and in a, in a weird way, we've survived. Imagine if we would have been integrated fully. And you also begin to see, especially in the early 1800s, different races, different ethnicities. Italians can integrate, the Irish can integrate, Hungarians can integrate. There's something particular about black people that we were never allowed to integrate. And, and the main thing is colorism. You know, it, it's color. It's, that's, you know, and, and even with my family, uh, my, my, my grandfather was a dark-skinned black male. He, he wanted to marry a light-skinned white woman. And they would ask him why. Well, because, you know, his kids might have a better chance because they might be light-skinned. And that actually bared out. You know, they had six kids. My mother was one of them. They had, you know, three dark-skinned children, uh, three light-skinned children. And there was always this sort of indifference towards my mother, that she's my skin color, versus my aunt, who was lighter. And that's something in particular with the Black community. We can talk about other communities, but in the, in the Black community. So there's just a lot of different dynamics going on, but uh, also this whole concept of self aid so when you look at black people and because black people did not have the stuff of europe they were never allowed to be what i would call full citizens we've been in this sort of second class citizen mode um a lot of the fear directed towards the black male form is um it's not necessary in 1915 a movie came out called birth of a nation dw griffiths the first motion picture and what that movie did was it depicted um, the KKK is this force that would go in and, and protect white womanhood. And you had a black mulatto man who was trying to be with a white woman. So you, you, he, they had to, the KKK had to protect um, white womanhood. That movie had a huge impact on black people because not only did um, Woodrow, the, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, uh, say that that movie is, you know, it was amazing because it was a, the first motion picture. He said that the movie was so true because it really wasn't. Once black people were free, there was never this, you never saw gangs of black men going out and, and raping white women. Now that's not to say that sexual assault doesn't happen, but this whole psychology of white womanhood and protecting it, that, a lot of that goes back to slavery and you know, criminal justice system. So once again, a lot of this stuff was uh, never reconciled. So let's move forward a little bit um, and just talk about this, this concept of blackness and whiteness. Um, blackness, I, I would suppose, is a, a thing. It's a concept. Um, you know, as a humanist, I personally, I don't judge anyone on their skin color, but um, you know, the, the term African-American itself, you know, we don't really use the term, especially in the States, European-American or hey, my buddy's a, a Croatian-American, we say white, but African-American. And, and the thing about Africa, like I have friends who are from Jamaica, yet they have no choice but to put African-American on uh, uh, you know, uh, a government forum. You know, being from Jamaica and being from, from Kenya are two different things, but blackness denotes something that's almost automatically less than uh, to certain people. Um, so let's just move forward a little bit. Let's move to this whole concept of blackness. Even when black people are say, pull themselves up from their bootstraps and do well. 1921, you had um, something known as the Tulsa racial, the Tulsa race riots. You had this place known as Black Wall Street. And what you had, you had black banks, black hotels, black businesses, and black people were thriving. Black people were thriving in places like Tulsa, Harlem, 
certain parts of Florida, certain parts of Texas, third ward, uh, where I spent a lot of my time, black people were thriving. Thriving to the point to where the KKK, but also the systematic, you know, systematic oppression had to shut that down. So in Tulsa, uh, what happened was that you had this area called Black Wall Street and a black man went to an elevator. From what they say, he stepped on a white woman's foot and she screamed. And so for, they basically burned down Black Wall Street. The state of Oklahoma didn't acknowledge that until recently. Um, I am shocked and surprised that I knew that, but many of my white friends had never heard about it. Uh, the same thing happened in Portland, Oregon. Um, after World War II, you had a part of Portland known as Vanport. Uh, it was the second largest city in Oregon. Uh, they placed a lot of workers there after World War II in this area, and the dam broke and Vanport flooded uh, and killed, um, this is Jordan Eisenhower, killed a lot of black people. But from what we understand now is that they put black people there so yeah, you can have this place. So if the dam ever does break, you'll be the people that die. Um, you, you've had all these massacres. So even when black people are left to their own devices, you've had systems come in, displace them, uh, or, or outright, like in Oklahoma, kill them. Um, St. Rosewood, Florida, you had a, a, a blacks and whites were integrating in. A white woman, this goes back to the white womanhood thing, uh, yelled rape, and they killed uh, black men and women uh, as well. So uh, the reason I'm giving you this foundation is because a lot of this, you know, it's second nature to me, but it's also important to understand when it comes to the, the whole concept of dehumanization. Um, one of the main things that I study in research is also mar marijuana and marijuana recidivism. Having been from, I'm from Texas, where um, I've seen people go to jail, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 year life sentences for, for possession. Now I spent six years in Portland, Oregon where I have friends that own dispensaries. Marijuana itself, I don't consider a drug. Um, the only reason that marijuana is illegal in the first place in uh, the States was because uh, around 1937, there was a man by the name of Harry Aislinger uh, and he uh, ran an organization that was called the, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. It was the, basically the precursor of the DEA. The whole reason marijuana is illegal is because of racism. They did not want Mexicans um, having relations with white women. They did not want jazz singers uh, sleeping with white women as well. And so Harry Aislinger said that you know, they were basically going to shut down his uh, department. So he's like, I need a demon. So let me demonize marijuana. You had reefer madness, you had all this stuff happen. Um, as far as I understand what statistically, I think in the past couple of years, you've had about half a million deaths from tobacco, about 80,000 deaths from alcohol. You've had zero deaths from marijuana. Uh, and that, that's, those stats go back about two or three years. I still don't think anyone has overdosed from marijuana. Uh, but yeah, the reason that it's been, uh, criminalized in the first place was due to racism. I have seen marijuana and the possession of marijuana be used with, uh, with the war on drugs to criminalize black people. And not just, um, you know, if you're selling drugs, that's different. What I've seen is cops who would pull up on kids and they might have, like if you have a cigarette, cigarettes made of tobacco, you have the tobacco flakes, you have marijuana flakes. They'll take the little um, drug tester, put the flakes in there, you can't smoke flakes and like, oh, you're in possession. And what I've seen is what cops would do is they would enhance that charge from possession to possession with the intent to distribute. So now I've effectively made you a drug dealer. I've seen 18, 19 year old kids go to jail for possession. And in Texas, it's a you know, three strikes law. Even if it's a misdemeanor, once you get that third strike, you're five years state jail. So when you use the system to create second-class citizens through possession of marijuana, uh, that degrades uh, an entire race of people. And that's been used for years. That happened under Richard Nixon. And they knew that it was wrong and illegal. They came out uh, years later, Ehrlichman, uh, who worked for Nixon, and said, we knew we couldn't just demonize the hippies and the blacks, so we created this war on drugs to basically uh, lock them up. Um, so yeah, and, and so once again, this is all going on. It's all happening now. Um, 
and I keep hearing like from my students, well, you know, a lot of students don't want to deal with the issue at hand. And so they discuss this concept of black on black crime. But what is black on black crime? Because crime is crime. Crime is intraracial, meaning that someone more than likely that looks like me is going to hurt me. Someone that looks like Ian is going to hurt Ian, if, if that ever happens, you know, I, I hope not. Uh, but crime is uh, intraracial, meaning that 90% of the crime that happens against black people is committed by the black people. 82% of the crime that's happened in America against white people is committed by white people. So when you look at the media and you see this sort of demonization of black men, like I, I watch the news and I see like, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And you see black men committing crimes yet. Um, having lived in Portland, when you don't have a, a lot of black people, I saw the inverse because you have methamphetamines. Uh, and methamphetamines, you do have certain drugs that certain groups of people use. Black people primarily use marijuana uh, and crack cocaine. White people use cocaine and, and meth. Um, what happened though is like, basically black people with the use of marijuana and, and crack with the war on drugs, they were criminalized. Over the past three or four years with methamphetamines, they've come up with legislation, uh, they passed bills to help those people and look at it as a health issue. So black people got jail, white people got help and treatment. So once again, the system itself has been, and this was under President Obama when this all started, a lot of this uh, methamphetamine use. Um, and a lot of it is legal. A lot of it, you, this isn't street drugs, this is stuff that you're getting from the doctor. I mean, I was given a muscle relaxer from the doctor and the pharmacy kept refilling it. I'm like, I don't need any more refills. So whole other topic, but once again, the demonization of certain drugs and, uh, and certain elements that are used by black people as opposed to what white people use, methamphetamines, um, they got help. So um, let's move forward now to Ferguson. I still have questions about Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, in, in 2014, a young man by the name of Michael Brown was killed. If you look into the Michael Brown story, and I know I'm jumping around, but I want to get a foundation. Look into the Michael Brown story. Uh, Michael Brown was killed by an officer in Ferguson, Missouri. I know a little bit about Ferguson, having, like I said, I went to college in Missouri. Uh, it was always a depressed area. Ferguson basically was set up to criminalize the people that lived there, the vast majority um, of black people. It was used as a money-making endeavor. They were using Ferguson to generate revenue. So I believe a woman got a ticket one day for $120. She got a parking ticket. After fines, after jail time, the fine went up to $500. These are poor people. So what they've done is they set up a city and they were basically using poor black people to generate funds. They build a new city hall, they're purchasing cop cars. So you have a city that's been depressed and they try to say, well, Ferguson was violent and violent crime was on the rise. Crime itself has gone down in America over the past several years. Now, one caveat is violent crime. Yes, violent crime has gone up, but if you look at it, it's 10 cities in general in America where violent crime has risen. Baltimore, Chicago, Houston, Milwaukee, uh, Cleveland, DC, Nashville, Philly, KC, St. Louis. Those are the 10 cities where violent crime has risen. That's it. Now, those cities themselves are entities that have a lot of issues. You look at a place like Houston. Houston is going through a massive amount of gentrification. They're the third ward where I, you know, my old stomping grounds, what they're doing is they're pushing the black people out and bringing in the Starbucks and the yoga studios. Well, if you gentrify people, they have, they have nowhere to go. They're going to go where they can afford to go. So they, after Katrina, uh, you had a place in Southwest Houston where a lot of black people went because they could afford to go there from New Orleans, Louisiana, and crime rose. Well, that's because you put poor people on top of poor people and you took away their resources. So, when you start to look at the system and realize that it's all sort of tied in, it's added. I think that's a, a massive deflection. I can say that, yes, there are issues in the black community, but there are also issues in other communities. Violent crime, there needs to be something to, be, to do with that. But let me bring up this point. You've had organizations in Houston like um, uh, 
stop crime organizations. You've had the interrupters in Chicago. When you would have these organizations that would go in and try to help these communities, what happened was many times funds were taken away. So when I hear this talk about defund the police, first of all, that doesn't mean defund the police. That means that the police, I believe in America, took in $100 million, no, $100 billion. If we would just use some of that money and, 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 and use it and stop over policing certain areas. And I remember when we created Midnight Basketball in Southeast Portland. Crime dropped a little bit, but that was just one thing. Imagine if you put a, a basketball center here or, or use those resources, use that money to invest in the community and to invest in the police officers. Being a military person as well, the militarization of the police is ridiculous. Uh, I saw, a M, I'm in Bellingham, Washington, and I saw an MRAP the other day. An MRAP is a mine resistant vehicle. I'm sorry, people are protesting, but I don't have, I've yet to see a person use a mine against a police officer. It, it might have happened. So when you militarize a group of people and then use that group of people and direct that militarization towards them, and my background is psychology, the mindset of a soldier is to defeat the enemy. So if, remember, the, mili the police departments recruit a lot of guys like me. They want veterans because we have a certain mindset. So if you take that, if you take me out of Iraq or Afghanistan and you put me in a city like Houston or Boston, well, my mind is psyched up to find an enemy. And many times the enemy is people of color. Now the enemy is Antifa. Uh, and, and Antifa exists, I know, I'm, I'm, it's been six years in Portland, but they're fairly nebulous and a lot of the stuff that's happening has nothing to do with Antifa. This is a lot of the people rising up saying like enough's enough. Um, what else do I have? Yeah, uh, and also working probation, having worked probation for several years. You see the probation system, the uh, sort of cash for bail system, once again, is directed towards a lot of poor people, um, a lot of people that don't have the money to get out of jail. So what's going on now, as far as me being an outside observer and also someone who has protested, uh, not lately, but protested, um, due, not especially due to COVID, this is all coming to a head. This has been going on for literally centuries, especially with black Americans. This has been going on for a quarter of a millennia. And so my thesis is that either you fix it or, or you don't. I'm also a humanist. I also identify as agnostic atheist. So there aren't a lot of me out there as far as, and, I, and I'm with a group known as black non-believers are in a ton of us. So when I try to talk to certain groups, um, you know, they want to know my religious affiliation. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. And that's already as a black man, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a black atheist. Like, okay, like, <laughs> it's, uh, but I'm also a humanist. So I like to see the humanity in people. But the main concept of this dehumanization that has happened to people over several years, over several generations, over several centuries, uh, I think it's all coming to a head now because either you, fix the issue or not. And we have politicians that, even, that don't even want to address the issue. Um, so yeah, once you've observed dehumanization, uh, sort of over and over, you, you start to become numb to it. Um, my experience with the indigenous people has really been volunteering in Portland and also uh, volunteering when I lived in Vancouver off of East Hastings. Um, once again, you can either humanize someone or not. And as a black male, I have gone through this whole process of self-actualization, um, realizing that I'm also cognizant and aware of who I am. I understand, I'm a large, I'm, I'm a 250 pound man. So I understand the effect of me when I walk into a place. And I'm cognizant of it, not saying that anything bad is gonna happen, but I also have to watch my back constantly because someone could accuse me of something. And I think that goes to the stress of the black male form, uh, just having to basically be on guard almost 24 seven. Um, but to kind of finalize my spiel, because I want people to ask questions, you know, um, what's going on in America right now, um, what I've seen in Canada over the past couple of weeks as well. And I hate to say this because I, 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 I love Canada. I spent so much time there, whether it was Victoria, Nanamo, 
Salt Spring Island. It seems like the things that happen in America, I see Canada as a place that can be a home for African Americans. And I've spoken to African Americans about this, and they don't they don't see it that way. They see America is my home. I'm a veteran. I served I served this country. I don't see it that way, and I haven't saw it that way for a long time. Same thing with me being a humanist. I started having questions when I was about 12. It doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> so, so I'm a, a realist. The things don't make sense to me. So Canada itself, and I know Canada has its own issues. I, I saw MP Singh today. Uh, but I've seen Canada as a place where there is a psychological weight that is off my shoulders when I am there. I'm not saying nothing bad cannot happen to me there. But, and, I, and I also talked to Ian about this. I get that feeling primarily from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, being a Southerner and, and realizing that different people in different geographic areas have different experiences, being a Southerner, having the ability to live anywhere I want to live, I chose Vancouver or Victoria because um, it's a place where I feel safe. But there's a caveat to that. There's also this concept of social isolation. I realized if I moved to Vancouver, when I was in Vancouver, when I was at UBC, if, if I would see a black guy on campus, I'm like, hey, what's up? You know, it was just, it was rare to see. You know, even just walking down the streets of Vancouver, walking, I, I lived in Kitsilano. Uh, there's also a camaraderie there between the, 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 the black people that are there. So I've always seen Canada as a place that black people might want to go. Frederick Douglass, actually, that was his plan, was to have groups of black people settle, not just in Nova Scotia, but in Vancouver and Toronto. And I think you have a lot of, not a lot of the numbers, but immigrants from Africa or the Caribbean, but African Americans, the immigration stats are, are quite low. You don't have a lot of people doing what I uh, plan on doing. So. So that's my spiel right now, but I'm gonna see if Ian wants to ask me any questions. Of course, we still got 30 minutes, but I wanna be able to answer some questions uh, as best as I can. Like I said, my background is psychology and criminal justice. I haven't really done much of the psychology, but um, you know, I can answer those questions too, because I think that the psychology of a people who have been oppressed for a while, it starts to wear you down. And I think that's why this is happening. This, is, this has a lot, this is primarily due to police abuse and police overreach. But I think that if you keep kicking a person and kicking them and kicking them and kicking them, it's like you kick a dog, they're gonna bite eventually. And I think this is the bite that's happening. And I think it's happening throughout the, it's not just happening in America, this is happening on a, on a global scale. So, uh, so yeah, Ian, I'll, I'll toss it back to you. You know, if you got any direct questions you wanna ask me and uh, hopefully I can answer everything. Sure. Thank you very much for that, uh, Corey. I see one hand, and I'll get to that in a second. I see a question came through privately asking uh, about similarities, differences between Canada and the U.S., specifically Western Canada, and you were touching on that right at the end there. Um, you know, some of, and we talked about that a bit in, at the start around the differences in Canada, and some of it in Canada, especially in Vancouver, historically is more folk has been more focused on anti-Indigenous and anti-Asian attitudes. I mean, that said, when you, when I've looked at the stats in Canada, you know, we do have issues of over-incarceration of Black people in Canada. Carding is an issue. Uh, I think the most prominent example was when Desmond Cole, the uh, journalist and activist against carding issues, this is street checks when police randomly stop yeah. people and say, where's your ID? Uh, he came to Vancouver to speak out against this issue and he was walking around Stanley Park having a smoke and the police stopped him. Our police, Vancouver police. So, I mean, I'd, not to answer the question for you, but just to kind of add some of the thoughts. I don't know if you want to expand on that. We do have a few more questions coming in. Sure. Speaking of Desmond, I have his book right here, which is funny. because <laughs> his, book, his book is it, it showed me a lot. Um, I can only speak for myself. Um, in Vancouver, I, I would walk everywhere. Like I said, I spent most of my time in kids. I never had an issue there, but that's me. And I can only speak for myself. But I looked, I looked at the stats, and you're right. And I, and I saw what happened uh, to Desmond there. Um, I think because there are so few black people in Canada, in, in Vancouver specifically, Victoria uh, even less, because I spent a lot of time in Victoria as well. There aren't that many of us, so I don't think that that stigma is naturally there. I don't know. I know that you still have police officers. 
uh, one of my best friends when I was there worked for Vancouver Police. Um, what I have seen having volunteered off of these tastings is how that the same things that black people deal with in the States, they direct the cops direct their energy towards the indigenous population. Um, and I think you always sadly have to have a, a, you have to have a, a upper group and a lower group. You have to have these tiers of people, which I don't understand why. Uh, and that's why I think I'm also a humanist. But my experience, and that's not to say that things wouldn't happen for me or change or be negative for me once I arrived there, but my experience I think was different. I'm also coming from a place of privilege. I can afford to move to Vancouver, BC. You, everybody, not everybody on this chat is from Vancouver. Vancouver's an expensive place to live. Um, my situation's a bit different. That affords me a little leeway. I, I don't know what it affords me. It affords me a, 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 little, a little space, but from the black people that I've spoken to in Vancouver, they tell me that a lot of it is psychological. A lot of it is the social isolation of being the only black person in this program or being the only black person in this neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, having spent time on the UBC campus, once again, like I said, if I would see a person, I would acknowledge them, but there weren't that many of me there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost sadly like a black person in Vancouver was an anomaly. Um, and so unless I was out there doing something wrong, I would kind of go about my way, which causes to me a, a lot of psychological um, alleviation because I know I've been followed going home in Portland. I've been followed in my nice car in Houston. I didn't get that same experience in Vancouver, but then again, my time there was a year max brief. But I know enough to know that I'm still cognizant and aware of, of who I am in Vancouver. All right, I see a number of other questions. Before uh, I move on to that, I'll just say, we'll follow up if there's interest and in, based on tonight, I think there is with more talks perhaps with someone from Vancouver to speak more from the Canadian side of the border on these issues. Um, you know, you're not the expert on Canadian racism, <laughs> so it's <laughs> worth having someone who can speak directly to that. I know some people involved with Hogan's Alley for Society, for example, and if people don't know the history there, that was the black community in Vancouver that was displaced by the building of the viaducts. And there's a number of people doing a lot of good work to help um, rebuild that. Another thing, that was just pointed out regarding racism is CBC recently reported that the highest number of police killed, uh, people killed by police in Canada per capita is in British Columbia. And that's disproportionately affecting the black and indigenous communities. Uh, I'll turn it over to, I'll, I see a question from uh, Marty Shoemaker. And so I'll unmute you for a second and let you ask your question, Marty. My question is, uh, do you think, given what's happened here with Floyd and uh, the other uh, events that have happened in the last uh, three weeks, do you think that we are at a tipping point now, particularly if the policing system begins to uh, in involve people who witness these things and prosecutes the observers, even though they are police people, so that not only Coven gets uh, arrested, but the other three people who watched it are gonna probably lose their jobs and may go to jail or at least be involved in the crime. I think that's one potential tipping point in the policing culture, which is protected by the unions. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has some validity uh, along with the fact that if we defund some of the million, hundred million dollar budget, billion dollar budget and put it towards teams and community things and begin to split that up and demilitarize that, you think that can be a real turning point for the inner city black in the United States? No, no, okay, that was a great, it was great seeing you, but it was a great question. As far as the first question, I think we are at a tipping point. I think not just because of what's happening with uh, what happened to Floyd, uh, George Floyd, but I think that combined with being in a pandemic right now, uh, you know, you have people that have lost their jobs. People are like, why, why are these people out there working? People have lost their jobs in the millions over the past several months because of the pandemic. So 
Uh, but directly to your point, yes. Yes and no, because if you start convicting cops, because it's almost impossible to get a conviction for a cop. Uh, case in point, you had a, a, a gentleman by the name of Botham Jean in Dallas, Texas, uh, sitting in his apartment eating ice cream. A police officer who lived in the same apartment complex went to the wrong floor, opened the door of his apartment, shot and killed him. She got 10 years. Uh, I think she should have got longer mistake or not. This guy did not deserve to die. That wasn't on videotape. What we saw with Chauvin was Chauvin didn't even care. Uh, Chauvin put his knee on, his, on uh, George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and, and 46 seconds. And he knew they were videotaping him. He just didn't care. And I think to your point, I don't think he cared because these unions are so powerful. The, an incident that I was involved in where um, a gentleman shot a kid, uh, as soon as he finished, the kid survived, but he didn't call dispatch. He didn't call a lieutenant. He called the police union. What do I do? And that's the process. So yes, we have to find a way to sort of take the power away from the unions. And to your, to your second point, um, yes, I, I think that properly, and that's the key is property, like invested in, in certain areas. You've seen places thrive, places, certain parts of Baltimore, certain parts of Portland and Seattle thrive when you invest in the community. So it has happened. Uh, it just has to be the political power behind it. And right now, I don't think that there's, I think people are out there doing, politicians in particular, are doing the right thing, but let's wait and see. I don't have faith in this administration to do much. Uh, I see a couple, a few more hands, but I'll go first to some of the questions in the group chat here. There's a couple people asking about mental illness and the connections with the people being murdered by police, for example, a couple people in Canada recently have been shot following uh, what are called wellness checks, where police are called just to check in that someone who might have underlying issues is okay, and the situation escalates, and the person ends up being shot by police. Uh, do you see this as an issue in the U.S. as well? How do you connect this, these issues of over-policing and access to health care? Gotcha. Uh, under the Reagan administration, what Ronald Reagan did is he began to shut down a lot of the, um, uh, the mental health homes, uh, these, you know, these places where people that had mental health issues. Uh, when I worked in the jail, I would say a vast majority of the people that I dealt with had mental health issues. That's, the jail isn't a place for someone that has a mental health issue. They need to be in an institution. And I know that, and that goes back to funding and defunding. If you would take some of I think during the pandemic, they sent the government, everybody got a check for $1,200. They spent trillions of dollars. Why can't we use some of that money to increase uh, mental health facilities or reestablish them? And they were not perfect by any means. But once again, if I see someone on the street who's schizophrenic, that person needs help, that person doesn't need to be in jail. Uh, jails are overcrowded with people that have mental health issues and they have been uh, since the 80s. Um, so to that point, and, and as far as the police and what they're doing with people, number one, they're not trained to deal with that stuff. And that goes back to defunding. You need more social workers. You need people that are e even having a team of people. Like usually you have two cops on patrol. Have one who's a straight up officer. Have another one that has some expertise in mental health. Uh, and, and, or someone that has a social work background. Someone that can actually deal with the situation where you don't have to kill people. And I know the case you're talking about in Canada. That happens in the States uh, way too often. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it comes back to money and funding. Uh, but that, under the Reagan administration, you, would see, you saw a boom in the, the prison system. And the vast majority of the people that were there were, number one, people that were there for marijuana, which is ridiculous. But also, uh, it's not a, a, a place for people that have – jail is not a place for people that have mental health issues. And yet they get funneled there, and that's been a problem for, for, for years now. All right, we'll go to uh, Murray next. I should have said this before I turned it over to you, Marty, but given the tight time constraints, let's all try to keep our uh, comment slash questions to you know a minute or two, after which I'm gonna chop you off pretty hard going forward so that we can wrap up by the hour and I'll have a nice quiet evening after that. Um, all right, Murray, over to you. Hi, hi, Corey, thanks very much for your presentation. 
Yeah, I was, you mentioned this issue of bootstrap, you know, and that, of course, that's the sort of the favorite capitalist conservative thing. Well, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. You know, so many people have, especially white people. And I, I was looking at some statistics or whatever, and even myself, I, I was taken aback because I was looking at median net worths in the United States, and I was looking at, at the white population, almost 200,000. And if you look at the black population, it's 18,000. Well, we know with 18,000, you may be able to buy a car, but you can't buy a house. You can't buy more property. So you're absolutely right about that. The question I'm, I'm leading to though, Corey, is that, is that I can understand you focusing on this, but do you think that, that there's a need now, this really is a crisis of global, cap, of global capitalism. This is what it is. Racism is one of the ways capitalism is ruled. It's ruled on also on deep, uh, you know, uh, oppression of women, misogyny. It's ruled on homophobia. It gets back to what you're saying. Your president is is the kingmaker when it comes to divide and conquer. My 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 question to you is that it seems that w while we need to solve this racism problem, is there not a way that 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 we can sort of bring together because there's many issues needing to be solved and they're all interrelated. It's all intersectional, as as you're aware. And I guess that's what I'm saying is how can we, you know, how can we do that? The other thing is the, 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 this is a no brainer. Okay. The, the left has all the progressive ideas and the right conservatives, they're the problem. I mean, this can't be any more clear than it's ever been in the world. Thank you very much. Um, as far as I'll keep it specific to capital, uh, capitalism and, and the States and especially from what I understand um, when it comes to black people in America, Black people in America couldn't build homes. And I know you, 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 you had a more macro question, but I'm gonna keep it micro. Uh, we couldn't build homes. Uh, there was this thing called redlining, so you could only buy homes in certain areas. I mentioned my grandfather. Right? When my grandfather returned back from the Korean War, he couldn't use his GI Bill. Uh, or he could use it at an HBCU, but the HBCU that, that was available didn't have a, the program that he needed. So, Oh, the reason that that medium, that net worth is so different because black people couldn't get a home that was worth anything, because, you know, because that's how people build wealth. They usually buy a home, they build their wealth, and they couldn't get a proper education. So those two things in concert uh, put us in the position that we're at right now. If you would have let black people purchase homes anywhere, and I've seen those deeds. My wife and I purchased a home in Portland, Oregon, and the deed was like, don't sell to, I believe the term they use is Negroes. Uh, uh, Irish people or Hawaiians like you know and that was a deed from the, the original deed so I've seen that if you cannot buy capital uh, if you cannot create capital uh, and the system is set up for you to do that for, like with the GI Bill you could only go to certain schools and that was contributed the states had to contribute to that uh, then you can't build it so you're right like I now as far as what can we do I mean now I can use the GI Bill I think this new generation especially I am okay, my sister's okay. I think, and not to try to put a, a rose-colored rose glass on this, most of the black people I know are doing great. But with that being said, we're also, like I said, we're only 66 years into this. Imagine if we would have started from where everybody else started. So I, I think that financially on a, on a capitalist level, I think, that it took, I think that we need to do more. Like I try to invest in certain things, but once again, everybody else, not everybody else, but the vast majority of Americans got a head start or they were allowed to do certain things that we were not allowed to. So I don't have the direct answer to that, but on a micro level, that's, that's what I can give you right now. The next question comes from the chat and a private message. Someone wants to know if you're gonna recommend a book about racism to someone who knows nothing about it, you know, what's your intro book or okay. even just some of the books you're reading recently? Gotcha. Well, right now, and because I'm moving to Canada, uh, The Skin We're In, the book that uh, when you mentioned Desmond Cole, this is, a, this is an amazing book. Uh, it has kind of opened my eyes. And that's more of a, a Canadian perspective, which I need. Um, also, uh, honestly, Race Matters by um, Cornel West. Um, I think I read that book when I was a, a teenager. Race Matters uh, and anything written by Tana Ishi Coates. Uh, if you can find anything by Coates, if you read race matters because what what uh cornell west does is he pretty much did what i just did he, he breaks down the history of it and and you know the title of the book is race matters but he breaks down the history of why we're in this place 
But this book also, like I said, The Skin We're In, and I'm not promoting this, it's just what I've been reading by Desmond Cole. It has really opened my eyes to a lot of the stuff that happens in Canada. And from an outsider, I am sort of shocked because I'm a Southerner and I'm looking at Canada with a lot of positivity still. I didn't know that you guys have the same issues. And it almost seems like, and this is not to be insulting, that Canada does a better job of just maybe not talking about it. That's the sort of feeling, because Can Canadians are awesome people. So they don't, but I mean, that's the feeling that the book gives me, that Canadians just don't want to discuss it. So uh, at least in America, not at least, but we're discussing it because it's so integral to our existence. Yeah, when you were mentioning uh, racist covenants, we have our, a plenty of those in Metro Vancouver uh, that would exclude Asian, Asians, I will, they would say Chinamen, of course, uh, black people, sometimes Jewish people as well. And so those covenants are also here as well. They're just not enforceable anymore. Uh, next question from the chat, and then I'll go to Ezra, and that might be all we have time for. Uh, is atheism prominent in the black community where you lived? How about in the prison system and humanism more generally in the States? Uh, just to answer that question, no. Uh, uh, I, I think I, I have one other black atheist friend. Uh, I'm, I consider myself agnostic atheist. He's a, a straight atheist. Uh, no. Uh, there's a group that we belong to called Black Nonbelievers. Um, Mandisa Thomas, if you look her up, she runs it. Uh, no. And, and there's a, a lot of baggage that goes with that because I was, I'm a PK. That means I'm a preacher's kid. Uh, so for me to be a preacher's kid from the South and to be an agnostic atheist, my mother has done a great job. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. And, and even my, my little sister, I think because she raised us to be just good people, I, I try. But, um, but yeah, there, there are not a lot of us uh, out there. I mean, you know, it's, it's – and I've had other family members that have had issues with it. Um, they always ask me for money, which that's a lot. <laughs> they always ask the non-believer. But, uh, but, no, there aren't a lot of us out there. Uh, but, you know, I, I consider myself a humanist first. Uh, but no, there we are. We're there are a ton of us. Marty was holding up and pointing out in the chat that Sakivu Hutchinson's books, Godless in Americana and Humanists in the Hood, are great ones that take your breath away. Uh, we had her come and speak to the BC Humanist Association a number of years ago. Uh, there's a few other suggestions in the chat as well. Uh, just a couple general announcements as well. Um, if you go to our website, bchumanist.ca, you'll see there's all kinds of events coming up. Our Vancouver Sunday meeting group is continuing to meet on Sunday mornings. Get in touch with Dan uh, if you want to join those chats. Uh, on Sunday evenings, you can watch Viral Transmissions, a locally produced COVID-19 show about science and just trying to break it down. And we're hoping to do a few more of these lectures and other programming throughout the summer. And members also should remember that on Saturday evening, we're doing a test AGM call through Zoom. And the following week, we will do our real AGM. And hopefully it will go as smoothly as tonight's gone, uh, as, which is pretty good for an online call. Uh, Ezra types his comment in, what do you think of Harvard University's Roland Fryer study about police shootings? I have not read that yet. Um, that's something I've heard about. I think I saw something, someone tweeted about it, but uh, uh, I need to check up on that. There's a lot of just, uh, I think I'm overstimulated right now with the amount of information I've been taking in over the past couple of weeks. So, uh, but that's on me, but I will look that up. I think I, I did see that on Twitter, so I need to actually read the study. All right. Uh, Corey, if people want to uh, follow you or kind of keep up with what you're doing, is there anything you want to plug? Any thing you're uh, working on no not really the the twitter account i think the tweet that you sent out if you want to follow me on twitter it's open uh i have nothing to hide i'm not yeah i just i'm pretty open so yeah just if you want to follow me on twitter i'm there um so yeah and, and also i just want to say thank you to everybody uh i i want to appreciate you guys letting me give my perspective um uh, you know just like i said from someone who's worked in law enforcement and also as a southerner and with all this stuff going on uh, just thank you, and I appreciate it, and I, you know, I look forward to hopefully talking to you guys again. All right, thank you very much. I saw a number of thank yous as well in the chat and on Facebook. So, good job tonight, and I hope everyone has a really good evening. All right.
Thanks so much, guys.